Hi, you found the way to the second part of this podcast, Neurology and Fabry Disease. We're still at the University Hospital of Ghent. Our host, Katrin van Elk, is talking with two neurologists, Dr. Himmelsut, who is a member of the PROSA team in the UZ Ghent, and Dr. Demisteder, working at the University Hospital of Leuven. In part one of this podcast, we explained why it is important to include Fabry in the neurologist's differential diagnosis. And now we will zoom in on the screening process itself. Dr. Hemelzoet, let's say you have a high suspicion a patient has Fabry disease. How would you suggest to organize a screening for the disease? So Fabry disease is caused by deficiency or absence of the alpha galactosidase A activity, which is an enzyme, and this is caused by a mutation in the GLA gene on the X chromosome, resulting in the accumulation of a globotriosyl ceramide, also called GB3 or GL3, and causing multi-organ damage. The diagnosis of classical Fabry disease in males may be straightforward, as it is an X-linked disease, whereas in females and in individuals with genetic variants uh, that are atypical, the diagnosis can be challenging. A diagnostic approach involving a detailed history, family history, physical examination, and clinical or biochemical findings is required, and eventually the diagnosis can be confirmed by genetic testing. Some clinical findings and signs can be typical, like acroparesthesia, angioceratoma, or cornea verticillata, and they may have a high specificity and should raise suspicion for Fabry disease. But the cornerstone of a confirmed diagnosis of Fabry disease, in male patients especially, is testing for the activity of the alpha-galactosidase enzyme, followed by the genetic uh, confirmation of a pathogenic GLA variant. Concerning the enzyme activity testing, in males, we can do it easily doing a, a blood test um, to measure the alpha galactosidase activity using a dry blood spot, or we can measure it also in leukocytes. Alpha gal activity is usually less than 1%, and this is highly suggestive for a diagnosis of classical Fabry disease. But the activity can be low but not absent, for instance, less than 30% in patients with late onset or organ specific variants. Even in the presence of clinical signs, the alpha galactosidase A activity can be variable and can be within normal limits uh, in female patients. Therefore, the measuring of the activity is insufficient to confirm a diagnosis in females. And similar to the clinical variety in females due to the X-linked inheritance, measurement of the enzyme activity in plasma or leukocytes, um, which is considered as the cornerstone of the diagnosis in males, is often inconclusive in female patients who can have as enzymatic uh, activities ranging from low to normal values. Next to the enzyme activity, there's a possibility to um, look for a biomarker, the so-called lyso-GB3. GB3 deposition is associated with cellular involvement in the disease, and this may lead to alterations in the tissue, and the cellular damage that is multifactorial um, can lead to the production of all kinds of uh, proteins, which uh, lyso-GB3 is, is an example. This plasma lyso-GB3 concentration appears to correlate with disease activity and disease stage, uh, and even with mutation severity. So this might be an additional method to look for uh, Fabry disease activity in patients with uh, abnormal uh, alpha-gal um, uh, activity. You talked about the role of genetic testing, um, foremost in female patients but also to confirm the diagnosis. Would you expect to see the same mutation in all patients? There is a great variety of pathogenic variants, and currently over 1,000 variants have been identified, many through screening protocols in some patient cohorts uh, with a typical presentation like stroke or cardiomyopathy. Besides classical mutations, which cause uh, a classic severe disease type in male patients, for instance, and cause the full clinical picture of Fabry disease, many variants of unknown significance with an attenuated clinical significance are known today. Some mutations can lead to a late onset or so-called organ-specific form of Fabry disease with milder symptoms and or later onset appearance of the disease. 
In addition, due to the increasing disease awareness and better availability of the genetic testing, there is an increasing evidence of genetic variants with no relevant degree of disease. And these mutations are still a matter of discussion until today. So this, together with the non-specificity of some Fabry disease symptoms, um, the diagnosis can be challenging for physicians uh, in, an, in their attempts to interpret uh, the GLA variants. So what if you detect one of those genetic uh, variants of unknown significance? Is there anything we can do to confirm the diagnosis? It depends if we look at a, a male patient or a female patient. I think in a male patient, it is of utmost importance to look for the enzyme activity of the alpha galactosidase A. If it's very low or even absent, I think it's a strong argument to confirm a diagnosis. Also look for the, the lysogb 3 biomarker can help, but especially for every variant of unknown significance in the GLA gene or in another genetic uh, disorder. It's very important to, to uh, segregate the variant in a family. So you look for the family history, you look for the variant, how it runs in the family, and if you have an uh, evidence for an X-linked uh, transmission pattern um, together with enzymatic confirmation or lysogb 3 as a biomarker, I think this would be the right way to come to a final diagnosis of Fabry disease. And if there is still some doubt, maybe we need to go as far as uh, go for a biopsy in affected tissues like cardiac muscle or kidney. So which types of therapy are currently available? Fabry disease is one of the rare diseases where there is treatment option available for uh, more than two decades for now, I think, especially the enzyme replacement therapy. So one key aspect of the management of patients with a pathogenic variant and uh, a confirmed diagnosis of Fabry disease is to evaluate if there is a need for a Fabry disease-specific therapy. This decision can be very difficult, especially in women. Um, but also in, in males with atypical presentation or young male patients without manifest disease, the deci decision uh, whether to start uh, a treatment can be challenging. And there's a very important role for a uh, multidisciplinary team, including Fabry specialists like the geneticist, the neurologist, the cardiologist, the nephrologist, and other people involved in the clinical care of the, the patients. So it's very important to assess the importance of the organ involvement and come together to a decision uh, whether or not to start treatments. Um, even in young male patients without manifest disease, like children or young adolescents uh, without manifest disease but who are carrying a pathogenic mutation in a family with, where there are uh, classical Fabry uh, disease patients already, uh, preventive initiation of treatment can be considered and uh, should be discussed uh, early. On the other hand, early and unnecessary treatment of benign genetic variants should be clearly be avoided to prevent uh, the stigma of a disease, which might not be the case, or to avoid exposure of patients to potential side effects and the burden of uh, getting the treatment, because it can be very heavy for a patient to uh, start with a treatment. Uh, so it should be uh, considered carefully whether or not to start a treatment at the right time, also for health economic reasons. So there is a very uh, special role for the multidisciplinary uh, discussion and decision. An important point is when to start the treatment. There has been a European Fabry Working Group a consensus statement uh, who stated recommendations on the initiation of therapy in both classic and non-classic Fabry disease patients in both sexes, but also regarding the discontinuation of treatment when uh, necessary. For instance, in patients who are not compliant or uh, who are refractory to the treatment uh, with evolution to end-stage uh, uh, major organ disease like uh, end-stage renal disease or uh, cardiomyopathy. So different clinical situations, when to start or when to stop uh, treatment, are uh, important topics to uh, discuss within a multidisciplinary team. Are there any new therapies on the horizon? So maybe first we can talk about the existing uh, therapies. Uh, um, for more than two decades, I think, uh, we have the uh, availability of uh, enzyme replacement therapies. The best known treatment options uh, there are the agalcidase beta and agalcidase alpha. 
which are recombinant uh, alpha-galactosidase treatments. But there is also a new kit on the block with the PEC unigalsidase alpha, which is a plant-derived alpha-gal. These treatments are intravenous infusions, um, and they aim at uh, decrease the accumulation of GL3 in the various uh, affected organs. More recently, a new uh, class of treatment um, has become available, uh, which is called the chaperone therapy. Currently, there's uh, in Belgium Megalostat as a potential treatment. This is a drug that binds reversibly to the active site of the amenable mutant of the alpha-galactosidase uh, gene and thereby increases the alpha-gal enzyme availability inside the lysosomes. Uh, by correcting a misfolding of the alpha-galactosidase. It's an oral treatment, so that's an advantage for patients, but the requirement there is that the, it's a mutation-specific treatment, so the uh, mutation needs to be amenable for the treatment. Another way of treatment uh, is substrate reduction therapy. There are two possible treatments. It's lucerastat and venglustat. These are glucosyl ceramide synthase inhibitors, and there are also oral treatments, and they aim at uh, also a, redu a reduction of the accumulation of the glycosphingolipids, uh, including GL3. One could think of a combination of those ther therapies, eh? uh, maybe on one hand an enzyme replacement therapy, and on the other hand either a chaperone uh, or substrate reduction therapy, but... Um, it's not possible to do that in practice because they are really expensive treatments and a combination is, uh, would be very uh, expensive. So it's not allowed uh, currently, but it's, it's a challenging ID uh, anyway. It seems like there's already quite a few options to treat patients, but is there anything new on the horizon? Yes, of course. Uh, we are facing a challenging era of gene therapies for many uh, genetic diseases. So more long-term treatments uh, are warranted uh, because the current existing treatments may help the people, but they won't cure the, the patient. And a more uh, long-term treatment which uh, tackles the, the origin of the disease would not only improve disease outcome, but it could go also greatly enhance quality of life for the affected patients. Gene therapies are being developed as a long-term treatment option based on the hypothesis that the targeted cells that are treated um, will overexpress the alpha-galactosidase enzyme secreted and subsequently uh, other cells will uptake it and transport it to the lysosomes. A possible advantage is that when it becomes available for patients, there might be a long-term effect and which uh, would prevent uh, major yeah. organ problems. A possible disadvantage currently is still that the, the gene therapies are still under investigation and that there's a, still a, a, an important difficulty because they lack target-specific vectors to get the gene therapy uh, to the real uh, affected tissues like cardiac, renal or uh, cerebrovascular cells. But the first uh, patients are, are already receiving gene therapy in, in, in trials where treatments with recombinant lentivirus treatments uh, are tested. So these techniques have the potential to be applied to the treatment of Fabry disease provided some concerns of the, the gene technology uh, regarding safety and efficiency, um, and this still needs to be addressed. The main challenging in this treatment is to achieve a high enough significant effect uh, that is in balance with the possible uh, safety issues because we do not want to get unwanted side effects, so-called off-target effects that would be unexpectedly uh, causing problems in, in patients. But when it will become available, if the trials with, uh, will proceed and will offer uh, good results, it could offer a long-term cure for uh, patients with Faber disease and genetic disorders uh, in general. Okay, now we have gained a better understanding on how neurologists should screen for Faber disease, but also how patients can be guided and treated after diagnosis. To conclude, I would like to ask one more question to Dr. Hemelzut. Could you give us an example of a Fabry patient you diagnosed in your daily practice? I remember uh, one um, emblematic uh, case of a 
male patient with uh, who was diagnosed with uh, Fabry disease with a classical phenotype when it was almost a bedside diagnosis. So I, I won't forget that one. Uh, it was a 35-year-old uh, man who was uh, on dialysis and he was in the hospital for his uh, dialysis uh, treatment. And I was on call and I was called uh, by the dialysis nurse because uh, she uh, saw that uh, the patient uh, had sudden speech difficulties. So they uh, suspected a possible stroke or even some neurological problem. So I, I went to see the patient and he clearly had... Uh, speech difficulties, and there was also a, uh, a mild paresis of his arm. Um, but it was uh, getting better quickly, and, so, uh, and after uh, 15 minutes, uh, he was completely recovered, so it was a, a TIA. So um, I saw him, we sent him to the CT scan, like a classical stroke patient. But an hour later, um, I was called again because the, the symptoms recurred. And it was also a short-lasting uh, symptomatology, again, with speech problems. So, But uh, in the meantime, I was having a look at his uh, medical file and the diagnosis of uh, recurrent TIA. I was looking at his file, so he was on dialysis because he had um, end-stage renal disease. He was on the waiting list for a kidney transplant. And the supposed uh, etiology of the end-stage renal disease was glomerulosclerosis due to hypertension. But I had a look in his file, and he also had a history of an episode of uh, atrial fibrillation. And I, uh, I asked him... Uh, did you ever had uh, an echo of your heart? And uh, yes, uh, he said. And I, I said, uh, what did they found? I, uh, they told me I have a very big heart. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I, st I stood at the bedside and I think, okay, uh, can I have a look at your body? And uh, I looked at uh, this uh, abdomen and I, he, there was plenty of uh, angiokeratoma. So um, it was just a, a small calculation with and the stroke and the atrial fibrillation and the cardiomyopathy and the dialysis uh, and stage renal disease um, and the angiokeratoma. So this was an unbelievable uh, bedside uh, suspicion and diagnosis of Fabry disease, which was uh, a few days later confirmed by an absence of the alpha glucose uh, mutation uh, um, uh, activity. And later on, we found a pathogenic mutation. And ever since, the, the patient is on the uh, uh, enzyme replacement therapy. Um, he still had some problems in the, I think, two or three year, years later. Uh, but in the meantime, he got uh, a kidney transplant and he's uh, stable uh, since then. So um, it was a very classical phenotype, but uh, unfortunately with a diagnosis that was made too late. So uh, the combination of the different problems was neglected by the individual uh, organ specialists and it took apparently uh, 35 years to get things together to come to a, a final diagnosis and treatment. And the patient was lucky that you were there at that time. That was a uh, yeah. <laughs> his luck. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you both for participating in this podcast. Uh, let's hope we've convinced fellow neurologists to be attentive to the symptoms of Fabry disease so that patients can be diagnosed and treated in a, a timely manner. If you appreciated this podcast, well, also check the other episodes of the Take Care of Rare series. Thanks for listening and stay tuned.